Hello everyone, welcome back to Family for Every Child's Conversation on Care podcast. My name is Amanda Griffith and I'm the CEO at Family for Every Child. This podcast is the space where we can hear directly from practitioners about how they are providing care to vulnerable children and families around the world. Family for Every Child is a growing network of 46 local civil society organisations working on the ground in 38 countries. These organisations have a wealth of knowledge and experience from years of working with children and communities to help to develop solutions to improve children's care. In today's podcast, we'll be exploring <clears throat> inclusive approaches to working with children and families in the LGBTQI plus community. Since its inception in 1921, Amara is an organisation that has been supporting children and families who are impacted by foster care or adoption in the greater Seattle area in the United States of America. Amara's focus is on meeting the needs of those who are most impacted, including Black and Indigenous children and families, low income and LGBTQI plus communities. It offers programs and services to families engaged in the child welfare system. Amara was one of the first child welfare organizations in the US to work with LGBTQI plus couples and individuals and single parents. Today, I'm delighted to be speaking with Nicole Mason, Chief Program and Policy Officer at Amara. Nicole, welcome and thank you for joining me today. I'm excited to learn more from you. Thank you so much for having me, Amanda. I'm really excited to be here. So, Nicole, maybe the really the start start point for this would be to um, I've used the term quite consistently through the introduction of LGBTQI plus. Would you like to just start to unpack that that particular term for us and see what that stands for and and and, and what it means in different terms and identities? Absolutely. And thank you so much for the opportunity to do this. Before I start talking about what this acronym stands for, um, I want to start by just acknowledging that we're talking about a really large group of individuals made up of many, many people. And when we speak about large groups of people, it's important to remind ourselves that each group we're discussing is made up of a diverse group of people. So the LGBTQIA plus community is not a monolith. It's no, there's no group within it that is a monolith. Um, and so when I'm talking about this acronym, um, I'm talking about a wide group of folks. And, and what we're explicitly discussing is sexual orientation, gender, gender identity, and gender expression. And I wanna just share some definitions about those. So sexual orientation is about our emotional, romantic, and or physical attraction to others. And our sexual orientation is independent from our gender identity and our gender expression. Gender identity is our internal sense of being male, female, neither, both, or some other gender. And every one of us you, me, anyone listening, has a gender identity. Gender expression is the external appearance of our gender identity, how we express that to the world, how we express that to ourselves. It could be through our behavior, our clothing, bodily characteristics like our voice, and it may or may not conform to socially defined behaviors. LGBTQIA plus is an abbreviation for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex, and asexual. That additional plus is really important. It stands for all of the other identities that aren't encompassed in this acronym. And it's it's really important to understand that that like all identities, labels, language is evolving. And um, and what you'll hear me as we're talking, use LGBTQIA+, and then also queer um, as kind of a shorthand, um, but they're not necessarily exchangeable. That's 
really helpful. Thank you. And and I think that helps to frame the rest of the conversations. So thank you for that. So as I mentioned in the introduction, so Amara was one of the very first child welfare organizations in the US to start to work with LGBTQI a plus couples and individuals back in the 1960s, which was really very groundbreaking in that at that time, I can imagine. So in me recent years, you've received the highest tier of recognition from the Human Rights Campaign's All Children, All Families program, which promotes LGBTQI a plus inclusive policies and affirming practices among child welfare agencies. So could you tell us a little bit about that journey that you've been on as an organization? And, and obviously, that's an internal journey you've been on, as well as I can imagine that the external environment has changed radically over the period from 1960s through to the present day. Yes, absolutely. And I, I'll start by saying that our, our journey as an organization has been very long <laughs> and enduring, and um, and we haven't fully arrived. And I think that's an important piece of this. Um, so at the center of all of our work is really a clear and consistent belief that all humans, every human being deserves to be treated with not only dignity and respect, but also love and affirmation. And even with that core tenant, we've still made mistakes. Um, and we have been lucky enough to have staff, colleagues, and a community that tells us when we make mistakes so that we can learn from them. So in the 60s, we, um, prior to the 60s, Amara started as a baby home and has kind of a tale as old as time in the United States of um, mostly white cis women coming together to take care of children and um, everything that needs to be unpacked in that um, was part of our history. And um, in the 60s, we really stopped and asked ourselves who can and should we work with to ensure that children and youth have access to caring and loving homes, particularly when they've been removed from their parents and placed into the child welfare system or when a parent is choosing to place their child for adoption. And we determined as an organization that we would focus on assessing any applicant's ability to provide a safe and loving home. Um, and at the time that included lesbian and gay families as well as single parents. Um, so that was a really important first step. So just opening the door to, at the time we, believed opening the door to anyone. Over the years, we've really focused on creating a more inclusive environment at Amara um, that not only informs how we work with our clients, but also how we operate as an organization and how we create space for, um, for ourselves and for our colleagues to bring our full selves to work. In 2012, we learned about the Human Rights Campaign's All Children, All Families program that they actually began around 2007. Um, and we began the organizational self-assessment process. So I cannot speak highly enough of HRC's All Children, All Families program. It is an incredible resource to organizations. Um, it provides you with a self-assessment that you can go through to really see where are your strengths as an, as an organization creating an inclusive environment? And where do you maybe need some additional supports? And then they provide a great deal of resources. And um, they'll provide example documents for policies. Um, they'll provide important questions about things you may or may not be thinking of. Um, and also uh, site visits or um, lots and lots of training. So it's a really incredible resource. And that was, um, I think, one of the most transformational pieces for us as an organization was working with the Human Rights Campaign, All Children, All Families program. Um, going through the self-assessment, we learned a lot about kind of where we were and what we had left to do. Yeah, so part of working with HRC is it's an annual 
reassessment and every year you get to re-reflect on what you've been doing and we've grown along with that program and so in 2012 there was just one tier um, of of self-assessment and you got a seal of being a member of the all children all families and then over time they've added multiple tiers and now they have um, the highest tier is innovator status. And so we applied for and received that status, um, I want to say in 2016, and have maintained it ever since. Um, and part of getting that is really about demonstrating not only that you do ongoing training and create um, an affirming environment and that you have policies for families, you have policies for staff, you have um, you're really creating a welcoming environment and affirming environment for everyone that comes through your doors, but that you're also doing something to help shift the system as a whole. Um, so for example, we created a training for um, how to create an affirming environment in your home for LGBTQ youth. Um, so the first year that was the piece that was helped move us into innovator status. And then the next year it was we took that training and we made it a train the trainers so that rather than us having to provide that training for every family, other people could provide that training. So that's just an, an example of some of the work that we've done. And again, I cannot speak highly enough of this program and the resources that they make available to organizations. And is that just in the US that that's accessible or do you know, or is that something that other people in other countries would be able to access? Yeah, it's, I mean, there are, so I don't know if you can apply for um, various statuses if you're mm. outside of the U.S., but it is open source. So if Amazing. you are outside of the U.S., you can absolutely go to their website Amazing. Um, and access all of their online trainings. Um, and lot, there's tons of forms that are downloadable to show examples of like, an inclusive application form, um, mm -hmm. an inclusive home study question form, stuff like that. Brilliant. Very interesting. Because, can I just pick up on one uh, term that you use, which not everybody may be familiar with, and that was that you referred to white cis women. Would you let's like to ex expand on that so that people are clear what that term means? Yeah, so thank you so much for, I do this all the time where I will use a term <laughs> or an acronym and not even realize that I've done it. So I really appreciate the opportunity to, to say that. So white being a uh, race, cis meaning cisgendered. So um, presenting and feeling as though, so your social or your gender identity and gender expression is matches what your what you're born as. So I am a white cis woman. I was born identified female and I identify as female um, and I'm white. Great. Thank you. That's really useful. And one of the things that really comes through from what you're describing for me is that actually, as well as the external resource you, you've had for the human rights campaign, what's been sounds like what's really important is being an organization that both is listening and learning. Um, and you describe, you use that terminology quite regularly as a journey and a journey by necessity is one whereby you're really open to um, self-exploration, self-analysis and change. Um, so, uh, I, um, and I, I was just wanted to reflect that that's what I, it felt to me like those resources are only as strong as the organization's capacity for self-reflection. Um, which would be the important counterpart to that. And so linking into that, maybe you could just tell me a bit more now that, so what does that work look like now? And how do you embed this inclusive approach across all visual programs? And and I think that probably not what I'm hearing, and I think what's really important is when one's thinking about these really core values, and you spoke about sort of bringing your full self to work, is it's not actually, you can't just say, I'm going to do this in this program. The whole organization and all people working there, it has to be how you are and who and how you interact with others. So, um, so uh, just to think about that that a bit more and explore with us a bit more how you as an organization have, have made that possible. Absolutely, Amanda, you, you nailed it. Um, and I appreciate you 
pulling those threads out and kind of calling them out. I think it's really important to highlight that this, what I'm talking about is on multiple levels. So, you know, in, in social work, they talk about the meso and the macro and the, the middle. So I'm going to talk about the personal um, and the organizational levels. So on a personal level, um, the first step it, to truly embedding this work is to know that you are working with LGBTQIA youth, whether you are aware of it or not. Queer youth are disproportionately represented in the child welfare system. They're disproportionately represented in at-risk populations like homelessness, intimate partner violence, and many others. So you are absolutely working with queer youth. And it's important to know that you, unless you're an organization of one and you know your own identity, you are also working with LGBTQIA colleagues. If you aren't that colleague, then you probably have one. Uh, and I think it's just important to recognize that we don't know who who people are until they oh. disclose that to us. So if we know that going in, and that's something that we have to know, then organizationally, we have to assume that anyone who comes through the door could be queer, could be LGBTQIA+, and that we want to ensure that they not only feel welcomed, but celebrated, that they feel part of our community community from the moment they walk through our door. For many folks in the LGBTQIA community, general society spaces don't feel welcoming. They can often feel othered. And so creating a space um, that, that feels welcoming is super important. Uh, so some of the ways that we do that is th they can be really simple. You know, our website has pictures of the families that we work with. And so that means pictures of gay and lesbian parents. It means pictures of cis parents, straight parents, trans parents. Um, we have all gender bathrooms. So you don't have to choose a specific bathroom. Um, we have pride flags up. Um, we are an LGBTQIA plus organization. We lead through who we are. And so we create an environment for us and for our community. We also really focus on designing our programs for those who are most disproportionately impacted by the system that we're wanting to affect change in. And so in the child welfare system, those that are most disproportionately impacted include um, BIPOC families and youth, so Black, Indigenous, people of color, and LGBTQIA plus families. And so we really want to uh, build systems with and for those populations. So that means co-designing. That means asking for feedback. That means um, not just coming up with an idea internally, but really building something with, with a community. Um, one of the really practical things that we do uh, within our foster care program is we assess and train all of our families around creating, how to create and how to maintain an affirming environment for queer youth. So if a family is not demonstrating the skill of creating an affirming environment, we will first work around supporting them, giving them access to information, training, helping them understand the importance and the necessity of creating an affirming environment. And we found that for the most part, when people are not demonstrating the ability to create an affirming environment for youth, it's because they just don't know how yet. And they want to, you know, when you talk about the importance of creating a place where children can feel safe and loved and express curiosity, um, people want to do that. So we provide them with support and training to do that. 
And um, once they demonstrate the ability to do that, then we license them and support them in getting placement. If after all of that support and training, they still can't demonstrate the ability to create an affirming environment, we will not license them and we will not place youth in their homes. Um, and, and this is super important. One of the things that we've seen is um, we, we place youth from zero to 18. The vast majority of youth that come into care in the state of Washington are, um, are under the age of 10. And we have seen youth who in our foster homes, which typically your experience as a child coming into care is that this is a stranger you don't know, your things are uncertain. Um, it's hard to feel safe in those moments. We've seen youth express curiosity around their sexual orientation, their gender identity, and start to explore that. And even had youth come out in our foster homes rather early. So homes that we've had homes that are showing youth that it's safe to bring their full selves to the new space. Um, and as you said at the beginning of your question, uh, it we really are focused on listening and learning. Um, and so we are constantly welcoming feedback and we have to acknowledge that we are going to make mistakes. We are, we may have an approach that we think is the right approach um, that has been informed by our community and time passes, society evolves, community evolves and there's something that we need to shift or change. And when we get that feedback, we work really hard to incorporate it and to make changes to improve programs. And, and concretely, can you think of an example of where either the external environment has evolved or you as an organization has matured on that journey, where you could give us a specific example of where you sort of said, oh, wow, actually, we've been doing this, but this is what we should be doing because that's going to be much more inclusive and welcoming. Yeah, I can think of a few things and some of it has been Great. internal and some of it has been advocacy. So um, mm. in, internally, uh, you know, we, we really saw ourselves as part of the LGBTQ plus community. And, and we saw that as meaning lesbian and gay parents. Um, and, and that was also something that was happening within the queer community. I think there was, um, at, at the time, this was uh, earlier in the 2000s, um, you know, you could talk about being gay, you could talk about being lesbian, you couldn't really talk openly about being trans. And so we had a huge blind spot mm -hmm. for how we supported trans parents. Um, and I don't know that we would have been able to shift that on our own because we didn't, as far as we knew at the time, and again, we only know what people disclosed to us, we didn't have trans staff. Um, and so we really were gonna need to rely on our community to identify our blind spots. We had a few different trans parents apply and um, and really pushed back on the process. One pushed back on the process throughout. Another came back to us afterwards um, and said, I'd like to tell you about what this process was like for me. Would you listen? And, and we did. And, and one of the things that they said was that has stuck with me ever since was, are these questions that you're asking me about child safety, are they necessary for you to determine child safety or are they about your curiosity? And that was something that, you know, in the moment you're like, well, of course it's about child safety. I know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm doing. I, I'm inclusive. I care. Um, but we had to really stop and think and really sit with that question. And I think there there were pieces, the, the home study process, the interview process for getting foster licensed is very invasive. And, um, and getting at child safety means asking some really tough questions about people's pasts. But there was also a lot of stuff that we were asking that was about curiosity and was a lack of 
understanding, a lack of training, a lack of knowledge. And so we had to really sit with that. Um, and then going through that, that was the internal work. And we are so fortunate to have had parents who took the risk um, and took on the emotional labor of talking to us about that and helping us learn. Because when you when you are hearing from your community, you are learning on somebody. You are, they are doing work for you. And so mm -hmm. it is incumbent upon you to do something with that. So they took the risk to share information and we had to do something. Um, and so we did change some of our processes um, and that also led to uh, us advocating for changes within our state system. So we have our own internal processes, but then we have to take families through our state licensing process within our foster care program. And so, you know, we were able to push back on some things like things as small and concrete as um, the application from a long time ago said, wife and husband or mother and father. Um, and we changed it to applicant A and applicant B. Um, and we pushed our state to do the same. So no longer having any gender assumptions or any heteronormative assumptions about who the parents are that are applying. Um, we've also pushed, um, we've had polyamorous families come to us and our state historically only allowed licensing of two adults per home. Um, and we've helped to change that. And so multiple people can be on a license, but it's amazing how so many things are really because of a form um, and the power of changing a form um, can really affect real, real change. Which segues brilliantly into my broader question, yeah, which is the next one. Thank you for sharing that, which is that, um, as you said, this whole thing is within a certain context and the context that we know has changed um, and sometimes become more liberal, and sometimes less so. Um, and and not only within the US, but within the world of um, global environment, what we're seeing again is a, a lot of really worryingly pushback on all, on all of these issues and the closing down of societies and greater discrimination and prejudice. So I, I wondered if you could just talk about sort of, because the reality is that when you work on issues that have become politicized by others, it, it's a difficult environment in which to operate. So I just wondered if you could just talk us through a bit more about your experiences about the sort of the broader social political context and sort of really sort of how that, how that context has impacted on your work in the US and, and the particular challenges faced by the LGBTQIA plus communities, I think one would say, and Amara as an organization that supports those communities. Absolutely. So I think, just to kind of set the context of where we are located, um, we're in the state of Washington in the United States, and um, we are in the Puget Sound region of the of the state of Washington. So typically a much more progressive space. Uh, and LGBT. TQIA plus rights are really seen as as human rights in this in this space. And zooming out, we're in a diverse state. Um, not uh, not everyone in the state believes that LGBTQIA rights are human rights. Um, and within our country, that also is the case. And it is quite divisive right now. And that is um, really difficult to witness um, and be part of. And I think for me and for our organization, we really try to center ourselves in what I started with in holding that every person 
um, is an individual human being deserving mm -hmm. of love and respect um, and access to community. Um, when I think of what youth need and deserve, it's community. It's like, and, and I think community is a synonym for love. Um, it's connection. It is um, seeing yourself reflected back to you and other people. Um, knowing that you're not alone. Um, and, and I think it's important to understand that that is more important than politics. Um, and our politics impact people's lives. Um, and so every politician that I've interacted with gets that and understands that. And, and that is, is why they are called into, um, into government is because they understand that that role is going to be a means of affecting change. Um, but I want to go back to the importance of, of understanding not only the humanity, but what we talked about at the very beginning, that these communities are not a monolith. Mm. I think that's an important idea to hold as well. Um, when we make laws in any country, in any state, they impact people's lives. And, and I think a theme that you've also heard throughout this discussion is as you've stated, the need to listen and reflect. And I think it's important for all of us to understand and, and politicians in particular to understand that our experience is one of many experiences. Um, and so we are, we are working to represent a community. We're working to create community. Um, and it's important that we do that in a way that recognizes that what we think is best for individuals may be best for ourselves and may not be best for others. And so it's some of the best things that I've ever heard is about, you know, we should look to those who are on the margins and build space and society for them. Because if we build space and society with and for those on the margins, we will create a space that works for everyone. We have to look at who are we excluding and build a space that welcomes them in. Um, and we will, we will welcome everyone if we do that. Yeah. Um, inspiring, thank you, I agree. And, and I endorse that 100%. And so, Nicole, you just referred to sort of, there are different, uh, organizations and approaches that are out there and, and I know that just recently you had an opportunity to travel to New York with some of our other family members um, to visit an organization based in New York called Ali Forney which is a very well long established set up by Carl uh, to uh, really really respond to this issue which you referenced to at the beginning and well, which I don't really want to skirt over either is that the reality is, that I think has not been recognised particularly is that how men, much the issue of homelessness is also linked to um, sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, and, and that I think this is an area that very few organisations have recognised the correlation between those two. Uh, but the Carl, when he was working right back in the 1970s, recognised that and, and, and really established Ali Forney to respond to that, that context as, as much as he could. And so I wonder if you could share a little bit more about sort of um, what, what you felt were the highlights of, of visiting another organisation that has a long history of, of really working with the, on these issues and with these communities. Absolutely. It was an incredible trip. Um, and an absolutely amazing opportunity to um, be in a space with people from all over the world, um, while also being in a space where, where this concept of community was really built by and for the community itself. Um, 
some of the, I'd say the high level key learnings that I took away was just the power of connection, the importance of a space for self, a space for each type of identity, um, the importance of having empathy with people as opposed to sympathy for people. Um, I think that's a really, a really big piece that deserves to, for each of us to sit with for a little bit, that I think a lot of times individuals come into a helping organization um, with with a lot of sympathy for for a specific population. And, and that's their, you, you hear people say it was my calling a lot, things like that. And, and that it's really important to shift away from sympathy and to really tap into empathy and empathy being like, I can understand and see what your experience is. And if I can't, I'm curious enough to find out. And, um, and I want to sit with you in it as opposed to there, there's an amazing, um, an amazing cartoon that has Brene Brown describing it. And I highly recommend looking for it. Um, I'm sure you can Google it and just write in Brene Brown and empathy and sympathy. And she describes the difference. Um, and it's, it's a great tool to use with kids as well. Um, but really just being with people, I think is the important piece. Um, and then there were two more things that really stuck with me. Um, one, uh, and, and they're really closely related. So the idea of um, that there's a difference between building programs for people and having programs that are built by people. And that in order to do that really effectively, you have to center the people that you're trying to work with. Um, and I think this ties back to the empathy versus sympathy, right? So it's like, how can you be with people um, and center those in how you, in, in the whole entire process of creating programming. So if you're thinking about starting a new program, it's how you're designing it, implementing it, iterating on it. Um, and if you already have a program, it's really bringing people in to reflect on how you are currently implementing it and then how you can iterate it. Um, and when we were at Ali Forne, they talked about, they shared specifically about their youth advisory board and how it started as, um, as a little bit of a checkbox, as a little bit of a um, kind of perfunctory as opposed to really powerful. And the youth on the board named that. And, and they could have left it at that as an organization. They could have been like, we hear you and please continue to be on this board. Um, but instead they, they really listened. Um, and the youth advisory board provided feedback on, on what needed to shift and change and how to include their voices and how to make the role of the youth advisory board really have power, um, the ability to affect change. And, and now it's a key part of um, their their leadership team. And so they have members from the Youth Advisory Board impacting a variety of different spaces. And I think that's just a really concrete way that that others can imagine involving youth voice specifically. But also if you're not working directly with youth and you're working mostly with parents or you're working in adult homelessness, bringing people in who are impacted directly by your programs um, and asking them. Um, I think that's a learning edge for Amara. We are doing that now, but we used to passively wait for them to proffer feedback. And now we directly and explicitly ask for it. And, and that's one way to kind of relieve that emotional labor. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and I, I must admit, one of the other things when I went to Ali Forney was, was something that you described as so important is that sense of a really caring and loving environment. There's something 
it, it, the moment you walk through the doors, it's this immense sense of 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 a very nurturing um thing that you just think this is a joyful, loving space. This is really nice. Why wouldn't you want to be here? Yeah. <laughs> so. Fine. I, I mean, I don't really want to call, bring this conversation to close because it's so rich, but I'm conscious of time. So just finally, I wonder if you had any advice which you would give to other practitioners and organisations who are really starting to embark on this journey of becoming more inclusive in their work and, and think with children and families, if you could sort of think of, well, because it may feel quite overwhelming, all the things that you've explained is, gosh, how would I go from where I am now to there? Um, what would be sort of some some ideas about where, where one could start? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the most important thing is know that you're going to make mistakes. Um, and the worst mistake you can make is to not do anything. <laughs> um, the, the best mistake you can make is to do it wrong and listen to feedback and then do something differently about it. Um, so really give yourself permission to make mistakes, um, center humanity in every interaction that you have with every individual you ever interact with. Um, that's something anybody can do in their personal life or in their professional life. Um, uplift and really center the voices of those that you're working with. Um, don't ask for feedback unless you're willing to receive it and you're willing to do something with it. You will cause harm if you ask for feedback and don't do anything with it. So really make sure that you're ready to do that. And in order to be ready to do that, it might be good to start by accessing resources. Um, so I already shared about, um, we already talked about the human rights campaign uh, their their website is hrc.org. Um, Google HRC All Children All Families and and we'll get connected with their website. There's also this really incredible resource that I didn't talk about um, called the Gender Unicorn, and it's available through the Trans Student Educational Resource at transstudent.org, and it's um, it's just a very specific concrete infograph to look at sexual orientation and gender identity. It's a really fun tool to go through as an adult, but also to go through with kids. Um, so that's just a really great resource. And then just be be curious, Google, ask questions, um, try to find the information out for yourself first, um, rather than asking the youth that you're working with to educate you, try to educate yourself first. Um, and most importantly, in the words of Maya Angelou, do the best that you can until you know better. And then when you know better, do better. Beautifully put. Beautifully put. Thank you, Nicole, very much indeed. And I I, I, I feel bad at adding anything to that because that is a beautiful synthesis and, and, and summary of, of, of where one should be. But I, I just wanted to reflect back also that sort of, so many of the things that you were saying, as you say, they would apply to any strong human rights practice about really ensuring that one is inclusive. I mean, they, they, they are the fundamental building blocks of an organisation that is inclusive. And to me, what's really important in the things that you've reflected on is how this is as much, there, there is not or can't be a boundary between the personal and the professional. Um, that it that it has to be you have to be included in that and it has to be uh, a, a journey a self uh, one's own journey as well as an organizational journey but I think that so much of the of the um the language that you used has been very much about the very approach in itself which is very much as you said things about empathy things about listening and things so those are absolutely fundamental approaches and ways of being that, that enable a whole organization to then be inclusive in its practice. So, and I think the beauty of what you've also shared is to not make this feel like a really huge endeavor, because actually some very simple things like changing how an application form is written mm -hmm. 
can be incredibly powerful. Mm -hmm. So to not sort of set yourself such high um, standards or, or goals that you actually lose sight of what actually are quite tangible and uh, practical things that you could do differently that can actually be really transformative. So thank you very much indeed for sharing your wisdom and your experience. Uh, it's been uh, really insightful and, and inspiring and, and um, all credit to Amara and yourself for the work that you're doing. So I'd just like to say thank you to those of you joining us to listen to this Conversation on Care podcast. You can help us spread the word and engage further in our conversation and activities by joining our community on the Changemakers for Children community platform. Visit Changemakers for Children, or one word, dot community to register. The more users there are, the stronger we will be. We hope you will join us next time. And thank you for listening. And thanks, Nicole, very much indeed. Thank you so much, Amanda.